Um, hi everyone, welcome to the exercise class. I think we'll start because we have quite a um, dense amount of material for today, which I need to cover in 45 minutes. So, uh, but it's gonna be fun. So my plan for today is to first discuss majorization um, and important results from majorization and um, different instances it appears at in quantum mechanics and thermodynamics. And uh, then we'll talk about yet another problem about optimal cooling, but this time it will be connected to an actual research question, but we'll get there. Um, so let us start with majorization. So you already seen this notion in the lecture. Um, I'll try to explain it a bit differently, starting from a bit different point than Rolf did. Which I, which I think makes it a bit more um, intuitively accessible. So the intuition of majorization is the following. So in, in the lecture, we've seen one definition of majorization. I'll give you a different one, which is equivalent to the one that Rolf's given. So suppose that we have a d-dimensional vector r. So this is a d-dimensional vector. And we say that this vector is majorized by another vector s. So let me write maybe that they're both these vectors r and s. Um, and we denote it as r is majorized by s. If there exists d by d permutation matrices set uh, which we call pj and if there exists a probability distribution which we call small pjs um, such that r can be expressed as sum over j pj, pj, s. So the idea here is that if we take a vector s, then if we can find um, such set of permutation matrices uh, and the prob probability distribution over the set of permutation matrices, um, such that if we apply the permutation pj to the vector s with probability small pj, then um, we get the vector r. And I think from, um, so the way I would visualize it is, for example, one can imagine that the vector um, s is like, the elements of the vector of s are just like the small piles of sand which are next to each other. And each pile of sand has different height. And then what, what the one operation you can do, you can just, um, kind of re remix this um, this piles of sand, which is expressed by like applying a permutations to initial um, to initial sequence of this piles of sand with some probability and then get kind of a new um, sequence of this sand piles. Uh, and from this intuition, I think it's um, it's very easy to see why um, why the uniform distribution, the uniform vector, uh, is majorized by any other distribution. So if we consider this simple example of when we're thinking about these vectors as vectors of probabilities. So for example, S is a vector of probabilities, then we can always mix the components uniformly such that we get uniform distribution. So the uniform distribution, which is just this um, vector, uh, all components of which are equal to one over D is always majorized um, by S. Why? Because the, the easy way to see it is 
take the set PJ here as the set of all possible permutations um, for this vector and P and then the probability distribution PJ as a uniform probability distribution. Then essentially, um, as for example, for the first uh, for the first element of the vector, or oh, you have that each um, each element of S appears there with um, yeah with the same probability one over D, which sum up to one over D, because all elements of S sum up to one as it is a probability distribution. And so it, it, you can easily see that the uniform distribution is majorized by any other. And so this criterion um, with this permutation matrices and probability distribution uh, is equivalent to the criterion that Rolf has given. So this was in the lecture which I will not prove here, but for example, you can find the proof in the, in the reference that Rolf listed in, uh, in the lectures, just in the beginning in the first paragraph is just a review on majorization and its applications by Michael Nielsen. Um, and so this criterion is, suppose that we take the vector R and then we, um, Re reorder its elements in such that they go in non-increasing order. And we label such a vector as R arrow down. And the elements, which are the reordered elements of the original vector R, are just R1 arrow down, so on Rd arrow down. Uh, and then we, we do the same for the vector S. with the corresponding elements. Um, and then the criterion is that R is majorized by S if and only if uh, we have the following string of inequalities. So R1 is less or equal than S1. Then sum over, um, j from 1 to n, rj down is less or equal than sum over j from 1 to n, sj down, um, where j ranges from 1 to n minus 1. And then for the last sum, which ranges from 1 to d, uh, the sums are equal. Yeah, so the last, the last condition uh, in all cases that we will be looking at, and we mostly look at cases where the vectors R and S correspond to certain probability distributions, it is trivially um, satisfied. So this equals one for probability distributions. Um, yeah, so while kind of the first definition I was talking about, I think gives a clear intuition what majorization is, the second one is an easier criter criterion to apply for a particular cases of vectors, where you just have to essentially reorder the vectors in non-increasing order, and then check this criterion. Okay, so let us look at one example, extremely simple. So let's look at the triangles. So how can we um, introduce the notion of the majorization to just geometric objects such as triangles? So the triangle, um, if we're not considering like the scale at which it is drawn, it just it is can be just characterized by its three angles. So the angles theta one, theta two, and theta three. And 
then for for such a for such a characterization of triangles we can introduce the majorization because then we can introduce a vector of these angles right um which i think i'll write horizontally so I won't confuse myself and then just in a case with or just as in a case with the uniform uh, probability distribution being majorized by everything else, um, the equilateral triangle, which has, uh, which angles are, the angles of which are all equal to pi over three is majorized by all others. Uh, which, in its own uh, turn are majorized by just a triangle, which is essentially a line. So it only has one um, non-zero angle, which, which equals to pi. So yeah, so in, in a sense of this majorization, this equilateral triangle is um, majorized by everything else. And to, to prove this, one can just um, simply use for, um, the criterion before. Now, we were talking about the majorization concept for uh, vectors. Um, how can we introduce the majorization concept for matrices? So suppose that we are given two matrices R and S, which are both uh, Hermitian matrices of size D. So it's D by D Hermitian. Um, then we, def uh, we define, so we say essentially that R is majorized by S if uh, lambda of R is majorized by lambda of S where lambda of R and lambda of S are the vectors of eigenvalues of R and S. And since R and S are Hermitian matrices, then the vectors of their eigenvalues are real. And hence, um, we can validly just um, define this majorization concept for this matrices via the majorization concept for the vectors of their eigenvalues. Um, so these are eigenvalues vectors. So again, similarly to our observation about uniform probability distribution, which Hermitian, so um, the Hermitian matrices will mostly apply this uh, majorization no notion to or the density matrices, which describe the state. And which matrix corresponds, which density matrix corresponds to the uniform distribution? Of course, it's the maximally mixed state matrix. And just as we had this uh, little observation before that the uniform distribution is majorized by every other distribution, uh, the maximally mixed state um, on the dimensional system is majorized by any other um, state on, on that system. Um, yeah, so maybe to, to make, again, this, uh, to, to severe the connection of um, like this density matrices with the probability vectors that we were talking about before. Essentially, every uh, what is the meaning of this probability vectors for a density matrix? Um, so when you write the density matrix in its diagonal form, its diagonal elements simply correspond to the probability of measuring uh, measuring the state uh, in, in that basis state to which this diagonal element corresponds to. And essentially, then this probability vector just corresponds to this, to the probabilities of uh, to measure this particular state in in the basis where the state is diagonal. 
Um, yeah, and so this probability distribution. Yeah, sorry, you have a question? Regarding to what you were saying, so if uh, let's say R and S have different eigenbases, then we will have, uh, like, we, won't we ever have complex elements in our eigenvectors if we're comparing them one to each other or we're comparing them on their eigenbases or so I'm very confused about that. Okay, so essentially, um, when, when when we're talking about two matrices, these two matrices R and S, we do not generally assume that they commute, right? So um, so they might have different eigen um, eigenbases, but uh, in, and in this eigenbases they would have their eigenvalues, right? So the eigenvalues that we we are um, yes that we are um, considering. So first, the eigenvalues of a matrix, they don't depend on the basis that we are choosing for the matrix. Um, and these two um, eigenvalues vectors, they are, they, are, um, they are written, they can be written in different bases for R and S. Does it make sense? Ah, okay, it, yeah, it makes sense. So the, those vectors are just vectors in which we put the eigenvalues of the... Yes, exactly, exactly. Like it's not so, an eigenvector, per se. So yeah, so maybe just to make it more clear, so yeah, lambda of R is just like lambda 1 of R, so on lambda D of R. Where lambda 1 to lambda D are the eigenvalues of the Hermitian matrix R. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, welcome. Um, okay, and so then let us turn to a few important results about uh, majorization, which I will not prove here, uh, but I think they're either easily, they either easily follow from the majorization criterion or they were already shown in the lecture. So, so the first result is Horn's lemma. And Horn's lemma essentially says the following, that if we have two vectors, R and S, then R is majorized by S if and only if um, R can be expressed via S in a following way. So Ri equals sum over J, Uij uh, modulus squared, Sj, um, for where Uij are elements of some unitary matrix U. Yeah, there, the, uh, yeah, this is very much similar to like our exp how we expressed it with permutations and some probability distribution over these permutations, but oh, just using this unitary. Uh, from this horn lemma, what what directly follows is the sure horns theorem and the proof of the lemma actually already is already contained in a proof of the theorem in the lecture notes so yeah you don't have to prove it again and sure horns theorem says essentially that if we have uh, two vectors lambda and h I'm sorry for changing notation from uh, R and S, but I think lambda and H um, serve a bit of a different purpose here because lambda can also be understood as this eigen eigenvalues vector and H is understood as just like the horizontal, sorry, the diagonal um, elements vector. So lambda is majorized by, sorry, H is majorized by lambda if and only if 
uh, there exists a Hermitian matrix um, with eigenvalues lambda i and diagonal elements Um, H I. So, in a sense, um, the physical kind of intuition about this is the following. So, suppose that you have a matrix, um, and it is in in a diagonal state. So, its density matrix is in a diagonal state. Then you apply some operation um, to this matrix, which um, sorry, um, which kind of, uh, uh, which also adds to this matrix the off diagonal elements and changes the diagonal elements. Then the this matrix after the, this transformation will always be majorized by the initial diagonal uh, matrix. Okay, and the last uh, important result is called Ullmann's theorem. And it essentially says the, uh, the following. So this is already for the uh, matrices. So suppose that we have two Hermitian matrices R and S, then R is majorized by S if and only if there exists um, a set of UJs, unitaries, uh, and there exists um, probability distribution pj such that r can be expressed as sum over j pj uj s uj dagger so as um again coming back to our initial definition of majorization there we were just um kind of uh probabilistically mixing permutations of a vector here we are probabilistically mixing um, operations, uh, unitary operations uj that we apply to the uh, matrix S, or if it's a state, if the, if it describes a state, then the state S. Okay, and to further um, strengthen our link with the quantum mechanical case then let me list some of the applications of the majorization concept. So first, uh, let us look at probabilities of measurement outcomes. So suppose that uh, we have a d-dimensional system and its state is described by density matrix rho. Uh, and then we have the vector of eigenvalues, lambda of rho, which is lambda 1, so on, lambda d. Uh, then in, in its diagonal eigenbasis, rho can be expressed as just sum over j, lambda j, j, j. Uh, suppose that now we are uh, measuring the system in some other orthonormal basis, which we label as EK. What is the probability of uh, getting outcome K? So P of K is then trivially given to us by the Born rule. So it's EK rho EK. This will be sum over J, lambda J, EK J, J EK. Let us call EK J as UK J. 
what are what are the um, what what are exactly this UKJs? So we can form a matrix out of them, which has this uh, these entries, um, and this will be physically just a unitary, which uh, changes from the diagonal basis. Um, J into this orthogonal basis uh, where we are measuring, so uh, with with the states EK, the basis EK, um, and hence we can write, and it's a unitary, and we can write PK as lambda J, UKJ modulus squared, and by Horn's lemma. We get that PK, since we can write it write it in this way, uh, is majorized by lambda of rho. So essentially, we can uh, every probability distribution um, for any measurement basis, the probability distribution that we would get measuring the state rho in that basis would be majorized by um, it's eigenvalues vector. Um, okay, and conversely, actually, um, if we are given a probability distribution p k p of k, then we can always find a basis e k. Uh, Sorry. So if we, if we are given this probability distribution p of k, which is ma uh, which is majorized by the vector of eigenvalues of rho, then we can always find such a basis e k, uh, with with which we can measure in which we can measure um, this uh, the system, and get the probability distribution p of k, of the outcomes. Because Horn's lemma works both ways. Okay. So this was about the vector of probability of uh, measurement outcomes. The next um, thing that we look at is post-measurement state. Um, so again, we are looking at the system, a d-dimensional system, which is in a state rho. And suppose that we conduct a measurement, which is characterized by a complete set of uh, projectors pj. So then we can write the post-measurement state rho prime as just sum over j, pj, rho, pj. Then actually, uh, the, um, the conclusion that we can make regarding this post-measurement state rho prime is that it will be majorized by the initial state. So rho prime will be majorized by rho. And this also kind of corresponds to our intuition about the majorization concept. So majorization concept is um, something like if, if the first state is majorized by the second state, um, then the first state is in a sense more mixed than the second state or closer to the uniform distribution um, or the maximally mixed state, depending if we are talking about the probability distributions or about uh, the density matrices. Uh, okay, and I will not completely prove this here, but the hint is um, to use Ullmann's theorem Uh, for the unit uh, for the unitaries UK that we define as 
the following mix of the projectors. Uh, so sum over j e to the power 2pi over d uh, jk pj. Okay, so you can show that these are indeed the unitaries and that's um, and using using them just deploy the Ullmann's theorem. Okay, um, another concept is doubly stochastic matrices. Uh, so doubly stochastic matrices is this object which allows us to um, kind of easily um, like another way to essentially to define what majorization is. So the doubly stochastic matrices are uh, matrices, the elements of which are non-negative and real, uh, and also all the elements in, in a row sum up to one, and elements in a column also sum up to one. So essentially, if we have a doubly stochastic matrix dij, then with elements dij, then all dij's are bigger or equal than zero, sum over i's dij equals one, and sum over j's dij's also equals one. Uh, so for example, two by two doubly stochastic matrix is just this matrix t, one over t, sorry, one, one minus t, one minus t, t. See that every column sum ups to one, every um, every uh, row also sum ups to one. Of course, this is for t's which are between zero and one. Um, okay, what is the physical intuition for doubly stochastic matrices? So every doubly stochastic matrix can be seen as a noisy channel. So Suppose that uh, we have some input probability distribution, which we call PJ, and output probability distribution that we call QK. So these are um, d-dimensional probability distributions. And if we have a noisy channel, then essentially what what the, uh, what characterizes a noisy channel is the probability of an output k given that the input was j. Um, and then q k can be expressed as sum over j, p k uh, given j, p j, and this p k given j are exactly the elements of the matrix, which is for now actually is not necessarily doubly stochastic because of the simple observation. So while the sum over k for pk given j equals one, just, um, yeah, because, because uh, the probability of all outputs has to, given an input, has to sum up to one. The convert, uh, the, the other sum, so sum over um, j, so sum over pk given j over j is not necessarily one. So this is not true for all noisy channels. However, um, we are only looking at the particular type of the noisy channels for which this is true. And this is kind of an additional constraint. So maybe I also write that this is a noisy channel. So this is an additional constraint that sum over j, pk given j equals one. What does this constraint ensure? Actually, this constraint ensures only one thing, which is that a uniform distribution is a fixed point of this channel. So, So is the uniform history 
distribution. Uh, okay, so again, to uh, to recap what I just said is um, doubly stochastic matrices can be seen as noisy channels uh, with additional constraint of um, the fact that the uniform distribution has to be the fixed point of the channel. So if we input the uniform distribution, we should get out the uniform distribution. Okay, and given this concept of this matrices, we can formulate a theorem, which actually gives us a way to, um, yeah, to see, sorry, majorization. So if D is doubly stochastic, um, then it's equivalent to saying that dr is majorized by r. Uh, okay, so what does it mean? Already given our understanding of D as a noisy channel um, and also intuitive understanding of majorization as um, something that makes the vector more mixed in a way. Um, this, this statement is somehow already makes a lot of sense because if we have a probabilities vector, if we apply a noisy channel to this vector, uh, then essentially we, we are bound to get or something that is uh, more mixed or, yeah. Um, okay, so there are many nice uh, properties of stochastic matrices. Like for example, if uh, you multiply two stochastic matrices, doubly stochastic matrices, then um, you get also a doubly stochastic matri matrix. Um, they're not like, it's extremely nice because, for example, there is this caveat of if R is majorized by S and D is a doubly stochastic matrix, then from this it doesn't follow that DR is majorized by DS. But it's a good way to kind of connect uh, to the notion of the noisy channels and generally the majorization notion. Uh, yeah, in the exercise, you also have to see how the majorization concept plays out for a uh, state for thermal states, which is fairly easy to, you just need to apply the, um, like one of the definitions of, of criterions of majorization and compare this diagonal elements. And you'll see that the, the, um, state with lower temperature, it always majorizes the state with higher temperature. Because again, because the state with, with higher temperature is somehow more um, disorganized, more mixed. Yeah, so, um, intuition is like that. Uh, and now we have not so much time, but I'll try to cover it. Um, the second problem, which is the optimal cooling. So I have to warn you that this exercise is based on the actual research question. And I just uh, tried to um, take a particular research paper and condense it to, um, to the points in this exercise. So um, it, it can be uh, a, bit, a bit harder than the others. And I also marked the... Um, the sub uh, exercises in this exercise as star the ones that are a bit more involved. So this is based on the paper which you can find on archive. So here's the number. It's correct. It's uh, so one of the authors is Rolf actually. And this is uh, a paper which looks at the cooling bound of um, of a, of um, of a setting, and also looks at the optimal cooling process that we can have. And the setting is the follows: so 
we have a, a qubit, a real qubit, states zero and one, and the energy gap is e ES. And then we have a machine, or system that we call a machine, system B, and it has state zero, one, so on, um, db minus one, so the, um, the dimension of the system is dB, we call it, with the energies ranging from E0 that we just assume to be zero to the last energy that we call E max, and these are E1, E2, and so on. And these two systems are both are located in a bath, which means that their initial states are tau s of beta and tau b of beta, where beta is the temperature of the bath, the inverse temperature of the bath. We also assume that E max is bigger than the energy gap of the qubit and beta is bigger than zero. And the idea is that we want to cool the system S uh, given the system B. And the question is, first question, what is the cooling bound? So what is the lowest temperature that we can cool S to? Um, yeah, putting this question into the uh, into the measure of inverse temperature beta, what is the largest beta we can uh, achieve for the system S? So this is called a cooling bound. Um, and what is the optimal way of cooling? So in this exercise, we'll consider two ways of cooling. One of them will be uh, not optimal, but it will lead us to the cooling bound uh, quicker. And um, the second process we'll consider will be optimal, but it's a bit more um, difficult to consider. Uh, so, so our first process is cooling, but not optimal. But achieving the bound. This is something that you can actually already guess. So again, how these protocols for uh, cooling qubits go? So we have we perform some kind of unitary uh, process on S and B. Um, then we discard or reset the system B and apply that, that unitary again and again and again. And the process that we were considering in the previous um, in the previous exercise sheets what was this the swap process. And indeed there is there, there actually exists a swap process uh, for the systems S and B, which will lead to um, lead us to achieving the, uh, the cooling bound. Um, and the question here is, what is the virtual qubit that we have to choose uh, from the system B to, um, to achieve uh, yeah, the, the highest beta or the lowest temperature uh, for the qubit S? And this is something that you in principle already um, can answer, as in what is the swap process, even if we swap it with the virtual qubit? Um, when we swap it with the virtual qubit in the limit of, um, of n swaps, we always, um, yeah, we always essentially just exchange two states. So we exchange the virtual temperature of the virtual qubit with the temperature of the real qubit. 
and which of the virtual qubits of the system B has the high has the lowest virtual temperature, or conversely, the highest uh, inverse temperature B beta. Um, this is so we have our qubit, and the virtual qubit that we choose from the system B, if this is zero and this is E max is the one with the largest energy gap because the one with the largest energy gap given the initial that the initial state is thermal has the lowest um, temperature. So this is our virtual qubit V. So, and we for just perform a swap operation with this qubit n times, and the um, maximum inverse temperature that we are able to achieve is beta E max beta over E s, which is bigger than the initial inverse temperature beta because E max is bigger than E s. Um, okay, I think I'm out of time, but um, so this is essentially half of the exercise and this indeed give us, gives us this cooling bound in a very um, kind of easy, easy way. However, this process is not optimal, by, by which I mean is that there, there exists actually another process which achieves this bound faster. Um, and the way you can show it is kind of the second process, which is actually turns out to be optimal. Uh, it, it is a unitary which rearranges the, um, the eigenvalues of um, the joint state rho SB in the non-increasing order. So it, it just assigns to the, to, the, to the lower energy, it just assigns um, the higher eigenvalue and so on and so on. Um, yeah, and this the way this unitary looks uh, is written out in the XSL sheet. Um, and then one can, using the, the notion of majorization and seeing that actually every time we apply, um, we apply the operation, we reach a state which, is, uh, which majorizes the previous state. Um, we see that uh, also for, for this particular optimal operation, if we apply it to the state, it majorizes the state uh, to which we apply just the swap operation. And kind of by, by these considerations, you can see that indeed that operation is more optimal, uh, which rearranges these eigenvalues, and also it leads to the cooling bound. But these, the second part of the exercise is kind of optional. Um, yeah, I'll write an extensive solution to that so you, you don't have to solve it if you, if you, if you don't feel like uh, you can. But the first part of the exercise is pretty uh, in intuitive. 